Well, thanks everyone uh, for attending. My name is Alan Thomas. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of York, and I'm going to be uh, in the chair today, uh, as Radu can't make it, unfortunately. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Ilaria uh, Canovotto from the University of Maryland. Uh, she's a postdoc in the philosophy department working with John Horty. Um, I hope from here on in, both Ilaria and John will be able to deepen their connection to our project and what we're doing here at York. Uh, Ilari was previously a postdoc at the Institute for Logic, Language and Computation at the University of Amsterdam, known in philosophy as the Logic Factory. Uh, so it's, a, it's the place to study logic if you're a philosopher. And not only did she study logic there, but she was awarded the E.W. Beth dissertation prize in 2021 for her, her PhD. So the title of her talk today is Piecemeal Knowledge Acquisition for Computational Normative Reasoning. Over to you, Ilaria. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, let me share my slides. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, thank you so much, Helen, for your uh, presentation and for um, and for inviting me to give uh, a talk in this seminar series. I'm uh, uh, very excited to be here. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a paper that I have uh, uh, written with John. And uh, so let me start by telling you uh, what this paper is about. So uh, this paper is about the problem of designing artificial agents uh, that can learn and reason about uh, normative information. Why is this problem important? Uh, well, because uh, as we all know, um, technological advancement is leading to more and more artificial systems uh, that make decisions uh, that have uh, normative impact. Some examples of these systems uh, are um, elder care robots, child minder robots, of course, the self-driving cars, autonomous weapons, uh, and uh, more recently, systems uh, uh, that aid uh, medical professionals uh, make uh, allocation decisions uh, for organ donation. So there are two um, standard uh, approaches to this problem uh, with uh, quite of uh, well-known uh, advantages and disadvantages. The first approach uh, is uh, the top-down approach, uh, according to which normative information is explicitly encoded in some symbolic formalism. Um, for instance, uh, and very typically, a logical language. Now, the main advantages of this uh, approach are that uh, uh, the meaning of the representation involved uh, is clear, often supported by a precise uh, semantic theory, and that uh, um, relatedly, uh, the style of computation that these representations uh, uh, support uh, is uh, um, is very clear as well. So it leads to transparent and explainable decision. The obvious disadvantage of this, uh, of this approach is that uh, uh, it is simply not realistic to think that a substantive body of normative information can be uh, encoded by end. And this is because normative rule uh, typically comes with an open-ended list of exceptions and uh, are formulated using open texture predicate that need to be interpreted on the basis of the fact situation that we are considering. So in contrast to the top-down approach, uh, there is uh, the bottom-up approach, according to which normative information is acquired through machine learning techniques, uh, such as reinforcement learning or inverse reinforcement learning. Now, the main advantage of this approach is that it avoids the knowledge acquisition bottleneck uh, that affects the um, top-down approach. And this is because uh, um, if we use machine learning, we don't need uh, to encode uh, normative information by hand, uh, but normative information can be acquired by the system uh, through interaction with training data. On the other hand, it is very well known uh, that machine learning systems uh, uh, are black boxes, so uh, they, their decisions uh, are not explainable nor transparent. And this is a big problem in the normative domain where we would like to have uh, a justification for the decisions that the system take. So in light of the difficulties of facing a pure top-down and pure bottom-up approaches, uh, 
um, more and more researchers uh, are exploring uh, hybrid approaches uh, um, in which uh, machine learning techniques uh, are combined uh, with a symbolic representation. Now, the main um, goal of our paper is to propose uh, an alternative uh, uh, hybrid approach uh, in which uh, uh, a symbolic representation uh, um, is combined uh, not with machine learning techniques, uh, but uh, with a particular form of case-based reasoning, namely legal case-based reasoning. And more specifically, um, we propose an approach that is modeled on the practice of decision-making under precedential constraint in the common law. Now, I will spend the rest of the talk um, telling you the, detail, the details of this uh, approach, but uh, I would like uh, to uh, answer immediately three questions uh, that you might have just looking at this, uh, uh, at this slide. So the first question is, uh, um, isn't common law reasoning obscure and contentious? And if so, how can it help us design artificial agents uh, uh, that can reason with normative information? Well, the thing is that uh, um, researchers uh, in the field of artificial intelligence and law have recently developed uh, a number of uh, very sophisticated models uh, of legal precedent-based reasoning. And uh, um, our approach uh, is uh, based uh, on one of these models. In particular, the model that we use uh, is called uh, the reason model. And it was introduced uh, by uh, John and Trevor Bench Capon in, uh, in these two papers. The second question is, uh, um, in what sense uh, is this approach hybrid? So um, our approach uh, is uh, on the one hand uh, bottom up, uh, because normative information is acquired from judgments in particular circumstances, and specifically um, through um, precedent cases. And on the other hand, it is a top down because normative information encoded in precedent cases is represented in symbolic form. So the third question is, uh, okay, this all uh, looks very nice, but uh, uh, what are the advantages of this approach? Why would we even consider um, an approach that is based uh, on uh, um, common law reasoning? And the answer is that, uh, uh, as I hope uh, uh, to show you in the rest of the talk, uh, uh, the representation that we get uh, um, has very nice features. And in particular, it is a simple, realistic, and I think uh, also interesting. It is simple because uh, uh, it doesn't require us to articulate complex normative rules. It is realistic because it is based on a familiar human practice. So uh, reasoning with precedent cases uh, is not something that only lawyers do. It is something that we all do in our daily lives. And finally, it is interesting because uh, um, in, uh, in this framework, uh, normative information is acquired in a way that is a piecemeal, distributed, and responsive to particular circumstances. So um, after this uh, little bit of advertisement, uh, here is the plan for the rest of the talk. I will start uh, by uh, telling a few, by saying a few words about the common law and the notion of presidential constraint, just to give you some context uh, of uh, where the reason model comes from. Then I will uh, present you the reason model in details. And uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, I will discuss uh, one of the applications uh, that we consider in the paper, a robot chain minder. And if there is time, I will conclude uh, um, by telling you about some open questions uh, and developments uh, that we are actually working on. So um, let's get started. Uh, the common law and the notion of presidential constraint. So unlike the civil law, the common law emerges uh, not from explicit legislation, but uh, from uh, decisions in particular circumstances. And uh, uh, these decisions uh, then govern the way in which later courts uh, can decide future cases through a complex doctrine of precedence. In a nutshell, according to the doctrine of precedence, uh, decisions by earlier courts uh, constrain the decisions uh, available to later courts uh, while still allowing these later courts the freedom to respond to new situations in creative ways. Now, explaining how exactly this balance between freedom and constraint can obtain is a very uh, central and traditional problem in a legal theory. And the standard way uh, of addressing this problem is by saying that, uh, well, constraint is carried out by rules, 
uh, but uh, um, freedom comes in because uh, rules can be modified. Let me make uh, uh, this a bit more concrete uh, uh, with a simple example. So suppose that uh, Jack and Joe are the parents of two children, Emma and Max, uh, and that they decided to respect uh, each other's decisions concerning the kids. So imagine that one night uh, Emma goes to Joe and uh, she asks her if she can stay up and watch TV. Joe considers the situation and uh, uh, she thinks that, uh, well, Emma has not finished her dinner, so maybe she does not deserve uh, to stay up and watch TV. But on the other hand, uh, Emma is now nine, so she's old enough to stay up longer. Also, she has completed her homework and she has also completed her chores. So maybe it's, it's good to let her Emma stay up. So at the end of the day, uh, let's imagine that Joe grants the request, stating that Emma can stay up because now she's nine. Now, notice that this is uh, like a legal case. So a situation is presented to an authority, Joe, who has to make a decision and give a reason for her decision. So the key question um, in legal theory is, uh, what is the effect of this decision? And according to the standard view, the effect of just decision in this case is to introduce a rule. And the rule can take the form, um, a form like children age nine or greater can stay up and watch TV. Now let's continue the example. Suppose that uh, um, on the next night, Max goes to Jack and he asks him if he can stay up and watch TV. And uh, um, the situation presented by Max is exactly like the situation presented by Emma, except that Max, unlike Emma, has not completed his homework. So uh, suppose that Jack uh, this time does not grant the request on the grounds that uh, although he's older than nine, Max, unlike Emma, has not completed his homework. So this seems a bit puzzling because uh, on the one hand, we would like to say that uh, the rule introduced by Joe on the previous night on the previous night applies to this fact situation. So uh, Jack should be constrained to follow that rule. But on the other hand, Jack is not following the rule. So what is happening in this case? Well, according to the standard view, uh, what is happening is that by distinguishing the two cases, Jack is modifying Joe's rule into something like children age nine or greater can stay up and watch TV unless their homework is incomplete. So in other, word, in other words, uh, uh, what the standard view amounts to is uh, um, to saying that uh, um, courts are constrained to follow um, rules introduced uh, uh, by previous decisions, uh, but they are free to modify these rules uh, as long as they can distinguish the fact situation under consideration from precedent uh, fact situations considered in previous cases. And uh, here is where um, the main problem uh, of the uh, standard view uh, comes about, because uh, uh, the key issue is that uh, every fact situation can be distinguished uh, from any other fact situation. So basically, it is very difficult to find two fact situations that are completely identical from a legal point of view. And this means uh, that uh, um, by allowing rule modification, the standard view makes precedential constraint very hard to explain. So this is what uh, um, led Grant Lamond to introduce uh, an alternative view, uh, which is the view on which the reason model is based. According to this view, um, decisions of uh, a court do not introduce a rule, but rather they reveal a priority ordering between the reasons that uh, uh, obtain in the fact situation that the court is considering. In turn, constraint uh, is not constrained to follow rules, but it is rather constrained to be consistent with the ordering um, that earlier courts relied on in deciding uh, the fact situations that they were considering. And finally, this means uh, that the picture of uh, um, normative development uh, underlying the reason model uh, is a picture according to which uh, uh, normative development does not uh, emerge uh, by an, the elaboration of an increasingly complex uh, system of rules, but rather uh, by the gradual construction of an increasingly rich priority ordering among reasons. So um, the key question looking at this uh, uh, overview is uh, how can we make these uh, uh, ideas precise? 
And uh, fortunately, John uh, um, provide, provided us with a formalization of the reason model. And uh, um, this is what I'm going to talk about next. So at a very high level, we can view the reason model as consisting of two components. First, a representation of legal cases, and second, a definition of the notion of constraint. Legal cases are uh, represented as consisting of three key ingredients. First, a fact situation that is presented to a court, then an outcome, which can be either a decision in favor of the plaintiff or a decision in favor of the defendant. And finally, a rule that justifies the outcome on the basis of a particular reason that uh, um, holds in the situation under consideration. So let me uh, tell you how these uh, elements are modeled. First, the effect situation is modeled simply as a, fact, as a set of factors, where a factor is a, really, is a legally relevant fact or pattern of facts. So for example, uh, in, uh, in the situation presented by Max, uh, all of these elements over, over here are factors. And uh, it is assumed that each factor favors either the plaintiff, which uh, I will denote with pi, or the defendant, which I will denote with delta. So basically, for example, uh, the factor that Max uh, is at least uh, nine, nine years old uh, is modeled by um, this uh, uh, expression f1 pi. And the fact that it is, uh, that is completed this chores uh, is uh, modeled with this other expression f2 pi, and so on. A reason for uh, a side, S, which can be either the plaintiff or the defendant, uh, is simply a set of factors that uniformly favor that side. We say that the reason holds in effect situation just in case all the factors belonging to the reason also belong to the effect situation. And we say that if U and V are two reasons for the same side, then V is at least as strong as U, just in case all the factors included in U are included in V. So in our previous example, um, Jack decided the fact situation on the basis of the reason consisting of the factor that Max did not complete his homework. And this is a reason that holds in the fact situation. And it is a reason that is weaker than the reason consisting of these two factors. So Max did not do his homework and he has not finished dinner. Once uh, um, we introduce reasons, so we can also define um, the notion of a rule. A rule is a, a statement of this form, and it says that if the reason U holds in effect situation, then um, the court has a potent reason to decide that fact situation for the side S. So this rule is intended as a defeasible rule. Uh, it might be defeated by other considerations. We say um, that the rule R, so if this uh, uh, rule is R, then this rule is applicable to effect situation X, just in case its premise, so U, uh, holds in that fact situation. In, uh, in our previous example, uh, we could have uh, uh, a reason, uh, so this uh, could be a reason for the, for the plaintiff, and this could be a reason for the defendant that hold in the fact situation that we were considering. So, um, these are three notions, so the notion of effect situation, of a rule, of a reason, and of a rule are enough to define uh, formally the notion of a case. So in the reason model, a case is simply a triple that consists of effect situation um, X, an outcome S, which can be either pi or delta, and a rule uh, that supported the outcome because uh, its premise also in the fact situation under consideration and its conclusion uh, is indeed the outcome. A case base uh, in, uh, in this framework is simply a set of cases, so a set of triples of this form. We can now turn uh, to the notion of constraint. So in order to define the notion of constraint, uh, the reason model relies on two key ideas. So the first idea is that every case decided by a court reveals a priority ordering among reasons. And the second idea is that the decisions taken by later courts ought to be consistent with this priority ordering that was introduced by precedent cases. 
So from a formal point of view, this means that in order to define the notion of constraint, we need to introduce three more notions. The notion of an ordering induced by an individual case, the notion of an ordering induced by a case base, and finally, the notion of a inconsistent case base, because the idea is that we should preserve consistency. So we should not make the case base inconsistent. So um, this seems a lot, but the uh, only a little bit complex notion is the first one. And uh, uh, I will explain it uh, by using a picture. So um, suppose that uh, we have a case that consists of a fact situation X, which was decided for Delta on the basis of the rule R. And the rule R is the rule according to which um, because uh, of F1 Delta, we should uh, decide the fact situation for Delta. Now, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, when a court uh, decide uh, the fact situation uh, X uh, on the basis of this reason, what is uh, uh, telling us uh, is that uh, according to that court, uh, this particular reason consisting of F1 delta is more important than any other reason for the other side for pi that holds uh, in that fact situation. So in this picture, uh, F1 delta is a uh, uh, stronger or has higher priority than the reason you, and than any reason that is weaker than you. In turn, every reason that is stronger than F1 delta, so for example, the reason V or the reason consisting only of F1 delta and F2 delta is also stronger than this reason that was weaker than F1 delta. So this is uh, how we define a priority ordering induced by, um, by a case. So um, according to this notion, a reason V has higher priority than a reason U, just in case U is a reason for the other side that holds uh, in, uh, uh, in the fact situation X, and V is a reason for the winning side that is, a that is at least as strong as the reason um, that, allowed that allowed us to decide the case. Once uh, uh, this notion uh, is in place, uh, we can uh, define the other two notions uh, that uh, uh, we wanted to define in a pretty straightforward way. So um, we say that according to the case space gamma, a reason V has higher priority than U, just in case gamma contains a case according to which V is indeed uh, more important than U. And we say that the case base is inconsistent uh, just in case uh, the priority ordering induced by that case base um, is, uh, um, presents a loop. So just in case, according to that priority ordering, there are two reasons uh, such that uh, uh, the first reason is stronger than the second, and in turn, the second is stronger than the first. Now, uh, we can finally define the notion of constraint. So uh, remember that the intuition is that uh, the decisions taken by later courts ought to be consistent with the priority ordering induced by precedent cases. So formally, this is defined in this way. So suppose that gamma is a consistent case base. Then in the context of gamma, the court is permitted to decide the fact situation X for the side S on the basis of the rule R, just in case if we extend the case base gamma with this new decision, then we still obtain a consistent case base. So the idea here is really to preserve consistency. And now you might wonder that this is not yet a notion of constraint. Uh, what we are defining here, here is really a notion of uh, permission and in particular, a notion of permitted rule. So what this definition tells us is uh, what rules uh, the court can use, is allowed to use to the side effect situation. So how do we go from this to a real notion of constraint or better to a notion of permission and obligation? So uh, we do that in this way. So uh, suppose that gamma is a consistent case space. Then we can say that in the context of gamma, the court is permitted to decide the fact situation X for the side S just in case there is a permitted rule that favors the side S, and the court is obliged to decide the fact situation X for the side S, just in case 
all the permitted rules uh, favor S. So I uh, will just mention that uh, um, this definition is in line with standard deontic logic because uh, in a standard deontic logic, uh, if you know anything about that, uh, um, permission is uh, um, defined as an existential quantifier, which is what is happening here, and obligation as a uh, universal quantifier, which again uh, is what is happening here. So um, I bet that this, is, uh, that this might feel a bit abstract. So let me go back to our example. So remember that this is uh, uh, the fact situation presented by Emma to Joe. So once we represent the fact situation as a um, set of factors, we can represent the case decided by Joe as the case in which this fact situation has been decided on the basis of the rule consisting whose premise is the factor f1 pi and whose conclusion is pi. So once uh, uh, Joe decides uh, uh, this fact situation in this way, um, the decision induces a priority ordering among reasons. And in particular, um, the decision tells us that according to Joe, this factor f1 pi or the reason consisting of that factor is a stronger than the reason consisting only of, of the factor f1 delta. Now, uh, when uh, um, we put uh, the case C1 into our case space, we get a priority ordering induced by the case space, which is identical in this case to the priority ordering induced by the case. Now, um, when uh, uh, Max comes in and asks Jess, Jack uh, uh, to stay up and watch TV, and Jack says, uh, uh, no, you cannot stay up and watch TV because you did not do your homework, um, what is happening is that uh, uh, Jack um, reveals a priority ordering according to which the reason consisting of the factor F2 delta um, has higher priority than any reason uh, for the opponent for pi that uh, um, uh, occur in this fact situation. And in particular, uh, it, is a it has higher priority than the reason consisting of F1 pi. And notice that according to our notion of constraint, this decision is perfectly fine. It is a permitted decision because the fact that uh, um, F2 delta has higher priority than F1 pi uh, is perfectly consistent with the fact that F1 pi has higher priority than F1 delta. What Jack could not do uh, is to decide the fact situation on the basis of this other reason, because that would indeed create an inconsistency in our case base. So um, in this fact situation, Jack is permitted to decide um, against Max, but is not permitted to decide against Max on the basis of any reason. In uh, uh, this other fact situation in which we only have uh, uh, one factor um, against Max, Jack would be obliged to decide in favor of Max, because if he decided, in, if he decided against Max, he would have to do that only on the basis of this reason, and that would create an inconsistency. So there is no permissible decision uh, in favor of Jack in this situation. So this is an example of an obligation to decide for a side. Okay, so I have talked uh, about uh, the reason model enough and uh, um, probably you're now wondering, okay, why is uh, all this talk about the law useful uh, uh, for our in initial problems? So designing, um, agents that can learn and reason about normative information. And uh, uh, let me answer that question by uh, turning to um, one application of, uh, of this uh, framework that we have in mind. Um, so a robot chain minder. The application um, builds on uh, uh, our examples uh, of uh, uh, Jack and Joe. So uh, I will continue on that story. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I want to just uh, um, say uh, that it is a very theoretical application. So it's not that we have uh, built a robot and uh, solved uh, all the problems uh, um, about implementation that could be involved into that. So it's an idea. So here is, a, um, here is the application. So suppose that uh, uh, Jack and Joe um, go out uh, once a week. And uh, when they go out, uh, they leave their kids uh, with Charlie, who is a robot child minder. Now, um, besides entertaining the kids, uh, uh, one of the main tasks uh, of Charlie is to tell them uh, when it is time to go to bed. Now, from the point of view of a designer, 
uh, one key issue uh, would be how do we tell Charlie what is the appropriate bedtime? And there are different ways uh, in which uh, uh, the designer could address this question or could solve this problem. So a first way would be uh, to provide a Charlie with a bedtime parameter that Jack and Joe can set. But of course, uh, this solution is a bit problematic because uh, um, probably the kids uh, have a default uh, bedtime. Uh, so suppose that they normally go to bed at 9 p.m. But of course, there are exceptions. So if the kids uh, go to Charlie and they say, I want to stay up and watch TV, uh, and Charlie says no because it's 9.15, uh, then the kids uh, uh, might say, well, but we have been good today and our mother let us uh, stay up when, uh, when we have been good. So um, a second option is to um, include in Charlie's architecture, uh, not a bedtime parameter, but a rule-based reasoning module. So a module where um, Jack and Joe could write down rules uh, uh, with exceptions. The problem of this approach, which is basically uh, an implementation of the top-down approach, is of course uh, that uh, um, Jack and Joe cannot possibly uh, foresee all uh, uh, the exceptions that might um, apply to all possible future effect situations. So uh, the problem is uh, uh, the problem of top-down approaches uh, um, that uh, um, writing down uh, all the rules uh, is just not feasible. So an alternative uh, um, option would be uh, to design Charlie in uh, such a way that it can learn uh, the concept of bad time from Jack's and Joe's decisions. And uh, um, if we assumed a purely bottom-up approach or a standard hybrid approach, we might think of implementing this idea by using machine learning techniques. But what we want to suggest in this paper is that uh, uh, we, could re we could use uh, the reason model as a learning model instead. And uh, uh, this would be quite interesting. So in order to realize uh, uh, this uh, suggestion, what we would need to do is to include uh, in uh, Charlie's architecture, a memory of past decisions. So if Charlie has a memory of past decisions, so then uh, uh, the way uh, it would uh, build uh, that memory would be by observing Jack and Joe's decisions uh, in concrete cases. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we would need a quite advanced technology to make Charlie go around the house and gather information about uh, uh, bedtime in uh, real uh, situations. But an alternative way to implement uh, this idea would be to just ask Jack and Joe to fill out a questionnaire in which uh, they say, how they would uh, uh, decide uh, um, particular situations uh, in a uh, uh, paradigmatic example, in paradigmatic scenarios, uh, and uh, uh, how um, and which kind of reason they would provide for those decisions. So um, either way, uh, the key point is that uh, if uh, these uh, real or hypothetical scenarios can be represented as effect situations, and if uh, um, the decisions uh, by Jack and Joe can be uh, represented uh, as uh, um, decisions in the reason model, so as a triples of this form, then uh, um, we could uh, then basically uh, Charlie's memory would work uh, as uh, a case base. And this means uh, um, that uh, um, Charlie could uh, learn a priority ordering uh, between reasons just by applying the reason model. And this priority ordering would tell Charlie which uh, uh, decisions are permitted and which decisions are not permitted in a new fact situation. So uh, for example, if uh, uh, one night Max uh, um, goes to Charlie and he, and he asks, uh, can I stay up and watch TV? Then Charlie could uh, uh, consider the reasons that apply to this fact situation and for example, see that all the possible decisions are decisions uh, in favor of Charlie. And in that situation, um, sorry, in favor of Max. And in that situation, uh, Charlie would say, would answer, of course, yes, you can stay up and watch TV. On the other hand, if all permissible decisions are decisions against Charlie, sorry, again, uh, against Max, then Charlie would say, 
no, you cannot stay up and watch TV. A problem would arise uh, um, in case uh, um, we had uh, uh, some permissible decisions in favor of uh, uh, Max and some permissible decisions against the Max. So what uh, uh, should Charlie do in that case? Well, uh, um, one idea could be that uh, Charlie simply um, could simply call uh, Jack and Joe and ask them uh, and ask them to um, decide the fact situation. Um, and that Char and then Charlie would just uh, um, communicate uh, the parents' decision to Max. But another uh, way to think about that, uh, about this problem uh, is uh, um, by uh, imagining that Charlie uh, just uh, selects uh, one of these decisions uh, and then uh, um, he asks uh, later on uh, to Jack and Joe whether that decision uh, was a good one. So in other words, uh, Charlie could make a decision that could then be revised uh, later on uh, by Jack and Joe. Why is it important uh, uh, to um, that, that Jack and Joe can supervise or can revise Charlie's decisions? Well, because every time that Charlie selects uh, one of these possible decision, um, the idea would be that Charlie uh, included that decision in uh, the case space. And this would lead to a modification of the priority ordering among reasons that is induced by that case base. So um, in other words, uh, Charlie's decisions would affect the normative system uh, that Charlie is using. So we think that it would be important in that case that there is a, a supervision by uh, the parents. So maybe Charlie, by randomly picking this decision, doesn't uh, uh, do what the parents uh, would have done. So uh, that choice should uh, uh, not be considered as a valid choice to modify the priority ordering among reasons. So um, this is the basic picture uh, that we have in mind. And uh, um, we know uh, that uh, there are a lot of open questions that uh, uh, need to be addressed. Uh, so let me tell you, um, which questions uh, we are uh, considering at the moment. So the first question uh, concerns uh, uh, the properties uh, of the learned normative system. So um, we have seen uh, that uh, Charlie, that the idea is that Charlie learns uh, um, a priority ordering among reasons uh, by observing the parents' decisions uh, in particular circum circumstances. Mm -hmm. But the point is that uh, um, the decisions that Jacks, uh, that Jacks and Joes uh, take in particular circumstances uh, are reasonably thought of as decisions that are based uh, on uh, some sort of priority ordering among reasons uh, or preference uh, that uh, um, the parents have in deciding uh, the fact situations uh, that, they, that they face. So when Charlie learns a priority ordering uh, is basically putting together these uh, individual priority orderings uh, um, that Jack and Joe use. But then uh, there is a question as to uh, how close the priority ordering that Charlie learns is to the priority ordering that the parents learn. Uh, sorry, that the parents uh, assume. So um, what uh, uh, we are considering is a comparison between, uh, um, let's say, the distance uh, uh, between uh, uh, the learned priority ordering uh, in this case uh, and uh, um, the uh, normative system that Charlie could uh, learn by using other techniques, uh, for example, preference aggregation, uh, or for example, by using the standard view in legal theory instead of the reason model. And uh, um, an, even, an even more interesting question would be, uh, can we make a comparison between the normative system that is learned uh, through uh, the reason model and the normative system that would be learned by using machine learning techniques? Um, how, how can we even phrase that question? So these are um, very um, complicated questions uh, that we would like to consider. And we have started working on uh, standard rules. Um, and uh, uh, it's the, the, way, the reason why we think uh, uh, a comparison also with uh, uh, the literature on preference aggregation would be very interesting is that uh, uh, the priority ordering that is learned uh, through the reason model um, 
is learning in a way that is very different from standard judgment aggregation. And the reason is that in the reason model, um, we don't merge the whole priority ordering of Jose with the uh, whole priority ordering of Jack, but uh, um, we merge this ordering step by step. So we merge the portion of the priority ordering of Joe um, that is relevant to decide this particular fact situation with the portion uh, of Jack's priority ordering that is relevant to decide this fact situation and so on and so forth. So in this sense, uh, the priority ordering that Charlie learns uh, um, is learned in a way that is uh, piecemeal, uh, distributed, and sensitive to uh, concrete circumstances. So we think that there are some interesting questions there about the comparison uh, with other techniques of, um, to, to, to obtain, uh, to learn a normative system. The second question um, that we are working on um, regards uh, the uh, representation of, of effect situations. And in particular, in the reason model, fact situations uh, are represented by using very fine-grained uh, um, factors. So uh, this means uh, that uh, justifications for a decisions uh, are very fine-grained too. So we, when when Jack justifies his decision, for example, he says, uh, "Well, Max, you cannot stay up and watch TV because you did you did not do your homework." But uh, um, so. On the one hand, this is good because uh, this kind of justification is, uh, of course, responsive to subtle differences between situations, and uh, um, its application in uh, particular situations is uncontroversial. So uh, Max either did or did not do his homework. But on the other hand, uh, uh, this justification might feel a bit uh, uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, because uh, Max could always uh, uh, say, okay, I did not do my homework, so what? Why is that important? So uh, it would be nice uh, to um, have a representation of fact situations that also take uh, into account uh, higher order concepts or values. So for example, um, a representation that would allow us uh, to say, um, not doing your homework is bad because uh, you are lazy and laziness is not something, um, is not uh, a feature that uh, should be encouraged or um, not doing your homework is bad because uh, you disobeyed um, the, um, uh, what your teacher told you to do. So um, John and I are working on an improvement of the reason model in which uh, fat situations uh, um, are represented not uh, as a, um, a flat set of factors, but uh, as a hierarchy of factors where um, base level factors uh, support or, um, or do not support uh, um, higher level concepts. And ultimately the idea would be to also include values in this picture. So, um, Another uh, kind of question uh, regards uh, um, the role of justification and explanation. So where do, in particular, where does explanation come in in this picture? And uh, the question arises because uh, um, we can distinguish uh, two questions. So one question is uh, uh, what possible decisions are permitted in a new fact situation? And another different question is uh, how did the system reason its way to a permitted decision. Um, so the first question is a, a question to which uh, the reason model has an answer. It's a classification question and the reason model can tell us uh, in particular situations uh, which decisions are permitted and which decisions are not permitted. But the second question uh, is not uh, um, something that the reason model uh, um, can provide an answer to um, very easily because uh, uh, the reason model doesn't uh, tell us what is the reasoning um, that uh, leads uh, a court uh, or that could lead a Charlie to make a specific decision among a set of uh, particular decisions that are permitted. Fortunately, however, um, John has uh, uh, shown in his book, uh, uh, which is uh, forthcoming and you can find on his website, um, that uh, uh, the reason model can uh, be formulated uh, in default logic. And uh, uh, this uh, um, formulation in default logic would allow us uh, to obtain uh, 
so-called argumentative explanation for a decision. So an argumentative explanation for a decision is something like uh, um, Max uh, um, uh, cannot stay up and watch TV because uh, although the fact situation is, is uh, the same as the fact situation um, decided by Joe on the previous night, um, if we consider this and this and that factor, uh, the fact situation is different for this other factor and this other factor is more important than uh, uh, the factors that were present uh, in the previous fact situation and so on and so forth. So it's like a dialogue. It's a dialogical explanation of what's going on. And we think that the exploring the possibility of producing these kind of explanations is interesting because uh, um, uh, so argumentative explanations of this kind have uh, also been explored in the field of computational argumentation. And uh, um, they have been shown to be uh, very uh, useful, um, but uh, um, they, uh, the, the explanations produced there would be quite different from the explanations produced by the reason model. Because uh, first of all, uh, um, reasons are not considered in uh, uh, this model from uh, uh, the field of, argu of uh, computational argumentation. So it would be interesting to see what reasons add to the picture. And second, uh, um, because uh, uh, in this field, uh, inconsistent case bases uh, uh, would be or are quite problematic. And uh, uh, this is a problem because, uh, of course, uh, when uh, uh, we consider um, a bigger body of precedent cases, it is not at all unusual that uh, uh, that case base is inconsistent. So I say that this is interesting uh, and that the reason model could uh, um, say something about that, because uh, although the standard version of the reason model that I presented uh, is based on the assumption that the underlying case base is, in, is uh, uh, consistent, I uh, recently have explored the generalization according to which uh, um, the uh, reason model can be generalized to and, and be applied also to uh, inconsistent case bases. And uh, so it would be interesting to see um, whether that generalization to inconsistent case bases could also uh, be formulated into the fault logic and then um, generate a, an argumentative explanation. So this is uh, uh, all that I have for today. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Alan, for questions? Yeah, do people just want to put their hands up virtually while I scroll up and down the, the list? Niall, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, my name is Nair Salem. I'm researching at the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany, and I'm actually working more on the field of auto automated driving. So I felt, yeah, some relations to, to my work. And the question that I had is, uh, I have is specifically addressing the motivation that you raised, um, where you said that, well, machine learning has the advantage of not providing like such a bottleneck in terms of, um, yeah, eliciting the normative reasoning. Um, and what I was, what I'm still wondering is, how does the reason model um, overcome the issue of basically eliciting the facts that you put into the case space? So the rules or the, the prioritization, I understand that you can learn that, but still the question for me would be, yeah, how do, you, because the facts would still have to be modeled um, by hand. Um, so this would be the question, yeah, how, how does the scalability, uh, is, uh, how is the scalability affected by the reason model? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. It's a it's a very good one, and uh, uh, it is definitely a, a problem um, that emerges for the reason model. So how um, do we uh, how do we select uh, the factors 
in uh, um, particular fact situations. And uh, um, so uh, we raised that question in the conclusion of the paper. And uh, um, the answer um, is that uh, uh, people in the field of AI and law are um, exploring uh, uh, ways uh, of extracting factors by using machine learning techniques. And uh, um, in, uh, in AI and law, people uh, uh, start from uh, legal text, so legal text analytics. And uh, uh, so basically um, cases uh, are, um, are presented uh, in a textual form. So they use uh, uh, natural language processing or better refinements of natural language processing to extract factors. Um, so that would be a direction uh, to explore. Um, so my answer would be that uh, uh, in, a, um, in a very uh, simple, uh, um, so a very, a, a solution that would not involve machine learning would be um, indeed uh, uh, to um, encode the factors by hand. And that would be problematic exactly for the same reason why the top-down approach is problematic, uh, except that we would not need to consider exceptions to rules. So maybe it's slightly better. But uh, uh, it seems that uh, in, uh, in AI and law, people are really trying to use machine learning to uh, gather the factors. Understood. Thank you. OK. Babe. Thanks. Thanks very much for that presentation. It was great. I just have two questions. The first one is, um, when you talk about precedent and you talk about two courts making a decision based on materially similar facts, uh, what can happen is if you've got a higher court, it can then override any lower court. So do you make some kind of provision, for example, is it Jack and Joe, who may be then given priority in terms of making decisions above another? So that's my first question. And my second question speaks to the yeah. reasons. Do you somehow weight the reasons? And in what way do you do that? So how do you determine which is the stronger reason or the more important reason within the context? OK, so as to the first question, uh, there is indeed a, a literature on overruling. And uh, um, the way in which uh, um, the standard model and uh, or the standard view and the reason view uh, address uh, uh, the question uh, uh, is something that John has explored, and uh, uh, um, he talks about that uh, in his book. And uh, um, so there is no quick answer, uh, but uh, uh, one thing that uh, is very nice about the formulation of the reason model in uh, uh, default logic uh, is that the default logic allows you to introduce uh, um, statements uh, uh, that uh, uh, indeed uh, um, could be used to represent that sort of uh, um, uh, decision by a higher order court uh, that overrules a decision of a lower level court. So in the reason model, taken as it is, uh, it is very difficult uh, to explain overruling because we are just uh, considering courts at the same level. Uh, but uh, in, um, in, a, uh, in an enhanced uh, representation, you could indeed uh, also uh, study that phenomenon. Um, about uh, uh, the question uh, on uh, waiting reasons, I, I think it's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, one thing that is very nice about the reason model is that uh, it doesn't uh, require you uh, to wait reasons uh, before courts start, start uh, uh, making decisions. So uh, the idea is that uh, um, this priority ordering between uh, reasons is just revealed uh, by uh, the court's behavior. So in a sense, it's very uh, much decision theoretic. Uh, so um, what you do in the reason model is that you observe a decision and that gives you a, um, first information about uh, the court priority ordering. And then uh, um, a second decision comes in and that gives you more information. So the priority ordering be, becomes refi more refined and so on. But in the beginning, you don't need to wait uh, uh, the court's priorities or, um, so, sorry, you don't need to wait reasons. So in the beginning, you just uh, have no weights at all and no priority ordering. Then every decision tell you something, give you some information 
of the uh, priority ordering that underlied that decision. Does that answer the question? It does. Um, so if the, if the reason that comes in in the second scenario, how do you then determine that it will necessarily outweigh the first reason that you have? So it doesn't. Uh, um... So how do you, I mean, so they're now sort of jostling for, for position, for priority. So how do you actually grapple with that? How do you then determine which one would take precedence in the circumstance? Okay, do... so let's, let's go back uh, uh, for a moment. Okay, let's take uh, this slide, for example. Okay, so what is happening here? I'll make this window smaller. Okay, what is happening here is that uh, uh, in the first uh, situation, this reason has higher priority uh, than uh, this reason. So there is a decision uh, for pi on the basis of a certain reason. And now I guess your question is, um, how come that in the second decision, uh, this reason does not take uh, the highest priority? Exactly. That, what, 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 what tells you that the second reason now all of a sudden is more important than the first one? Okay, so uh, the reason model doesn't give you an answer to that question. It just, uh, and, and this is uh, something that might be puzzling, but it's also nice about the reason model. So the reason model, it just, te just tells you, um, okay, the only thing that you have to do once uh, uh, this reason um, is given a higher priority than this reason, is just to respect that priority that has been established. So if in another situation, you have a different reason favoring a, a decided delta, then you can use that reason to, um, to decide the effect situation for delta, because what you're saying is simply that, uh, uh, well, it is true that F1 delta has higher priority than F1 pi according to this decision, but this decision doesn't tell me anything about F2 delta. So the court that decides the case of C2 can now say, oh, well, according to me, F2 delta, for whatever reason, has higher priority than F1 pi. So I'm going to decide the case in that way. But the reason model is silent about the reason why the court has that thought that F2 delta is a, has higher priority than F4 pi. So it can be for many different reasons. And uh, the reason model is just, just doesn't represent that uh, um, process or that justification. Is, does this make uh, uh, the picture a bit more clear? Hi, everybody's muted. Okay, like a like an auctioneer. Um, do we have any further <laughs> questions from anyone? Jinwei. Yeah, I got a quick one. Thank you for the presentation. So it's a bit of an echo from Bev's question. So in extreme cases, um, if Joe and Jack make some uh, contradictory decisions based on the same factors, can you still learn from that? So that is Joe every time says yes and Jack says no, based on the same reasons. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, thanks. That's that's a great question. It, and it relates uh, uh, to the last uh, uh, issue that I raised about inconsistent case basis. So um, what you can do is to adapt uh, the reason model in a, such a way that if you have uh, um, a case base uh, that consists of gamma, uh, and uh, C2, so basically a case space that consists uh, of uh, these two cases, uh, sorry, let's say uh, C3. Sorry, this should be three, C3 because it's a different case, but anyway. So suppose uh, that we have the case uh, C1 and the case uh, in which uh, um, this fact situation is decided for delta on the basis of F1 delta. Now, uh, this case base would be inconsistent. I did study a generalization of the reason model in which uh, if you start from a case base like this, you can still uh, learn. So the reason model still works. 
what you cannot do, um, or at least what I, I did not uh, um, considered, is uh, um, a situation in which uh, a court is permitted to make uh, the case base inconsistent. So um, if you start uh, from uh, a case base that consists of uh, this case C1 and this case, uh, um, let's call it a C2 prime, then uh, you can apply the reason model. What I did not consider is uh, uh, if you start uh, uh, with C1, how do you build that inconsistent case base? Uh, that is not something that, uh, that you can do by um, using the generalization that I studied. But probably it's not, I mean, I think that the interesting question is uh, um, once you have an inconsistent case base, uh, how do you reason uh, on the background of that case base? rather than how do we build an inconsistent case base? Because uh, uh, in principle, we would not like to build uh, an inconsistent case base, I think. Yeah, thank you. Okay, strictly speaking, we've uh, run over time. I'm sure we're going to continue these conversations with Alaria and John in the future, hopefully in person in York at some point. Just to wrap things up, can we thank Alaria very much for an excellent and very clear presentation. Thank you, Alaria. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It was great to uh, present this pleasure. material As here. Say, we hope and to see you at the Atlantic at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yes. <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs>